Yeah, thanks so much, Jin Kang. And yeah, thanks so much for having me and uh, for the invite. And yeah, I'm super, super excited to be here today uh, to talk about the case for reasoning beyond recognition. Uh, I'll break down exactly what I mean by this in a second, uh, but I'll start out actually by uh, really just talking about why I'm interested in multimodality to begin with. Um, so this whole talk will be focused uh, on multimodal models, that is models that process more than one modality jointly. So this could be most commonly uh, text and images, but this can also go beyond this. So uh, you'll see uh, some of the projects we have touch on audio as well. Uh, but why might one be interested in multimodality in the first place? Uh, well, I'm like a very uh, practically driven person. So uh, in the end, I think I'm just motivated by all of the cool language technologies that simply require multimodal reasoning to work well. Uh, some cool examples uh, are things like alt text generation. Uh, so here, uh, the idea is that there are people who can't access web images uh, either because they're low vision or blind or because they live uh, in a location with not fast enough internet access to load the images. And the goal here is to generate captions for these images that give the same experience to people who can access the images and people who can't. Uh, usually, this kind of looks like an image caption or something quite similar uh, to it, uh, but not always, as we'll see in a second. Uh, so this is one really cool language technology that I'm excited about that simply requires multimodal modeling uh, to deploy at scale. Um, another one uh, is human-robot interaction. So I'm told that uh, the robots are coming. <laughs> People have informed me that uh, you know these robots are going to take over our uh, not only our software spaces but also sort of our more physical uh, embodied environments. And I'm going to be want to be able to talk with them in uh, natural language, say English, rather than a programming language. So uh, I'd like to be able to say something like, here are the yellow ones, and the robot should be able to parse that sentence and then map it on to the physical environment as interpreted by its camera uh, and map it onto these sort of yellow blocks. Uh, and so by the virtue of the inputs and outputs, again, this requires multimodal reasoning. Um, and finally, uh, a use case near and dear to my heart is uh, web video parsing. Uh, the idea here is that there are really cool uh, tools we can build that uh, augment the experience of watching web videos. Uh, in the case of Kim et al. 2014, uh, they did the study where they presented instructional videos to two groups of users. Uh, in the first group, they presented just the video. Uh, and to the second group, they presented a video alongside an annotated timeline of sub goals. Um, and it turns out the people in the second group not only had a much better time, like they reported enjoying their task much more, uh, but they actually produced better work in the end. And so this is pretty strong evidence that uh, if we were to be able to display something like this annotated timeline of sub goals alongside uh, a web video, uh, this would improve user experiences. But uh, to deploy something like this at scale, uh, you would need a multimodal machine learning model to generate uh, such a timeline. Um, so. This is not an all-encompassing list of all of the cool language technologies that I think we can build uh, if we just had better vision and language models, but I think these are three really compelling use cases that uh, drive me to be interested in this area. Um, cool. So there's my uh, whirlwind pitch of multimodality. Um, but today I'm going to be uh, making a more specific argument. I'm going to be making the case for reasoning beyond uh, recognition. Uh, if you ask other AI researchers uh, what reasoning is and what recognition is, uh, you might get a really broad range of answers. I'm not here to invalidate anyone else's uh, definitions. I'm more just here to tell you what I'm talking about. Um, and I think the best way to tell you what I'm talking about is actually just with uh, an example. So um, this is an example from Davis and Marcus, uh, this image here. Uh, it appears to be some sort of kitchen. Uh, there's like uh, some kitchen appliances. Uh, in the background, you can actually see a workbench that's sort of in the kitchen. So this is a little bit unusual. And alongside this image, there is this caption that says, this is Julia Childs's kitchen. Um, now, I didn't know who Julia Child really was prior to seeing this example, um, but it turns out Julia Child, uh, I looked her up and she's like a very famous chef. So she has cookbooks, she's been on TV, uh, and apparently this is her kitchen. Uh, so given this context, uh, you could imagine writing down a bunch of facts uh, about this uh, image and a uh, little bit of extra information. Uh, so you might start off with some very, very simple facts, uh, such as there is a stand mixer in this image. 
Now, if you look at the counter, uh, you can see uh, there's this blue appliance with like a big bowl. I think it's used for making bread. I've actually never used one, but uh, it sure looks like there is a stand mixer in this image. Uh, and you might make another observation, like the cabinets are painted light blue. Now, these are uh, kind of boring, right? <laughs> like uh, these are very much literal uh, inferences. They seem to be mostly correct. Like you would be very surprised if either of these were incorrect. Uh, but I would categorize these types of inferences as recognition style inferences. So these are things that don't re require a lot of context. They don't require a ton of world knowledge. They're very uh, not falsifiable. Like uh, it would be very hard to convince me that there is not a stand mixer in this image. Uh, and as a result, they're kind of a bit more boring, to be honest. Uh, we want to be able to do them, but they're not the sort of interesting inferences that you might make if you kept writing down facts. So uh, let's say, you know, I really uh, said, okay, these are great, but, you know, keep writing down facts. What else might you write down? Uh, you might eventually come to more interesting inferences that are not definitively true, but they're things that you think might be true. So you might infer that there could be a fourth chair just out of frame on the right. So if you see this table, it has like a yellow tablecloth and uh, three chairs are in frame. Uh, you might be able to infer using social common sense knowledge that usually when people set up a table, they do so symmetrically. And so uh, there could be, or there is probably a fourth chair just out of frame to match the one that we can see. Um, so if this was actually incorrect, uh, you wouldn't be so surprised. Like it turns out there isn't a fourth chair. You didn't do anything wrong. Uh, but we've sort of entered this realm of abductive uh, inferences. These are best guesses with incomplete uh, information. And uh, we think, and by we, I mean uh, some subset of researchers like me think that this is the type of inference that people really operate on when they're uh, navigating the real world. Uh, so I would situate these more interesting, uh, perhaps less verifiable, more contextual inferences, more towards the reasoning side of this spectrum that uh, I'm introducing here. So uh, you can see uh, towards the top, we have recognition style inferences. These are sort of obvious facts that you would be very surprised if they were incorrect, but in isolation, maybe aren't that interesting. And then as we move further down, we get towards reasoning style inferences, which are more interesting, perhaps a little bit less verifiable, but nonetheless, the sorts of things that we use when we're operating in a messy and incomplete world. And the argument I'm going to make today is that uh, those cool language technologies that I talked about a few slides ago, like alt text generation and you know robot uh, human interaction, uh, really do require more reasoning style inferences. Like it's simply not enough to uh, have our uh, vision and language models return just a list of objects concatenated together. There has to be some type of more interesting reasoning going on uh, over that uh, sort of perceptual inference. Uh, so that's the first part of the argument is that to build cool language tech, we actually need more inferences that are like the bottom of the spectrum. Um, the second part of the argument is that we're actually not very good at this. So we're getting better slowly at making more reasoning style inferences, but there are so many benchmarks out there that have a ton of headroom and we're just simply not very uh, good at this sort of thing. Uh, so that's the game plan for the argument uh, that I'm going to be making today, the case for uh, more reasoning style inferences versus uh, recognition style ones. Good. So uh, let's jump into this uh, first, first part of the argument. Uh, many vision and language technologies require reasoning. So you might be thinking, OK, like we'll just run an object detector. Like that's probably enough. And I'm here to hopefully make you think twice about that. Um, good. So this is a really cool study from Christ et al. Um, here, uh, they were considering the case of image accessibility. So recall back to the first cool language technology that uh, I described about uh, making web images more accessible, for example, to low vision and blind users via automatic captioning. Uh, what Christ et al. did was they went out to Wikipedia and they grabbed uh, images and uh, alt text associated with those images. Uh, in this case, these are human written, so nothing here is machine generated just yet. Uh, so here the image description is a freestanding open hexagonal gazebo with a dome-like roof uh, and so on. And I would be very, very happy if uh, vision and language models these days would output uh, recognition style captions that were this accurate. Like there's no uh, sort of hallucinated objects here. Uh, there's no, like just looking at the image, there's nothing really salient missing. Like it seems to capture at least one view completely of this image. 
Uh, and yet, this caption turns out to not actually be perfect for all contexts. Uh, it turns out if you use this caption uh, in the Sculpture Wikipedia page, uh, people rate it as not a good caption. Uh, I don't know what it is about the Sculpture page, possibly because um, like this caption doesn't actually mention the sculpture. Uh, this is simply not a good uh, caption for this image in this context. Whereas for Gazebo Wikipedia page, this is apparently a really great description. Um, and so you can see already that context is mattering here. So nothing is wrong with this caption, but uh, it doesn't account for the context in which it's shown. So uh, this isn't just this one example. Uh, it turns out if you measure the literal text uh, image overlap between captions and images, this is the y-axis here. Uh, the x-axis here is human rating. Uh, this is uh, the orange is uh, low vision and blind folks. Um, there's almost no relationship between uh, how good of a literal description the caption is and how much people like it. So this is kind of surprising. So like, uh, again, these are human written, so it's not as if inaccurate captions would be good. Uh, but once we have solved the sort of like recognition style captioning problem, uh, we're going to have to take more into account than just getting the objects right and pasting them together into uh, sort of a very literal description. Um, and so why might this be? Uh, so again, I'm just highlighting some uh, HCI work about image accessibility here, but this could be applied. Uh, I could make a similar argument for the other language technologies that I discussed earlier. Uh, again, we have this image. Uh, a very accurate recognition style caption might be some chairs in an office kitchen with oranges and a coffee machine uh, on the counter. I'd be ecstatic if vision and language models uh, were this accurate at output in captions these days. Uh, but it turns out, uh, depending on the information need of users, uh, this may not be a good caption. So um, these are quotes from real user studies, not about this specific image, but nonetheless, these are actual quotes from users about image captions. So uh, if someone was seeking a job and they couldn't access this image because, for example, they maybe were low vision or blind, um, they might want to know, uh, is this a cluttered office? Is this a like friendly space for me? Is this like a bright, like sunny place that I would actually want to work? Uh, this is one information need. Um, and another information need might come from someone doing uh, online shopping. So apologies for the uh, profanity. These are real quotes. Uh, so here the person was actually seeking kind of a very aesthetic description of an ottoman rather than uh, just listing out there is an ottoman. Um, so you can see that different information needs uh, require different captions. And to generate captions that fulfill these information needs, we're going to have to go beyond just very accurate recognition style captions. Um, good. So there's a very brief argument for one language technology, why we might need more reasoning style inferences compared to just object recognition. Um, good. The second part of the argument is that we need better models of reasoning. Um, uh, I'm going to introduce this example, VCR, uh, because it's a nice uh, running example that we'll see uh, a lot today. So for VCR, which stands for Visual Common Sense Reasoning, uh, it's a visual question answering data set which pairs images, uh, some references to objects in those images, uh, with questions about the objects in context. So in this case, the question is, why is person four pointing at person one? Uh, now, if you uh, are a human and you're thinking about the answer to this question, you might think the answer is sort of obvious, like, okay, person four is pointing at person one because they were the one who ordered the pancakes. Uh, but if you really break down the reasoning required here to go from object level inferences all the way up to getting the answer correct for this question, there's a lot going on. Like you have to recognize, okay, there's three people, they're sitting at a table, there's a person standing there, maybe this is some sort of cafe, maybe the background gives a hint to this, maybe it's the uniform the person uh, is wearing, and so on. And so to build up these recognition style inferences all the way up to reasoning style inferences is a lot of work. And uh, it turns out there's just a lot of headroom in this and related benchmarks uh, between the best model performance and human performance. Um, I actually have to update uh, the slide, these slides fairly regularly because uh, if you put up a leaderboard, people tend to climb it. So uh, there still is for this, uh, this task uh, significant headroom, but uh, you may have to uh, you know, edit this later, uh, maybe in about a year, uh, we'll see. Uh, but there's always harder benchmarks out there. So I think it's fair to say headroom exists. Um, so now uh, I'm going to try to make an argument that uh, recognition, better recognition doesn't actually help that much with uh, VCR. And to do this, I'm going to introduce this clip model, uh, which kind of took the computer vision world by storm. Uh, I guess this came out in 2021. 
Uh, the idea here is that we're going to train an image encoder using a bunch of text captions scraped from the web. And I won't get into the details here, but uh, if you look at this plot, uh, the y-axis is the average accuracy over 27 different recognition style tasks. And the red lines here are clip. So all the variants of clip seem to just be, at least at the time, dominating uh, all of the competition. And these are very competitive benchmarks. And so this model, when it came out, was just so good at recognition that everyone switched to <laughs> kind of using it. So uh, yeah, if you, if you go to vision conferences these days, like, yeah, it's like clip X, clip Y, a lot of titles with clip in it. It's sort of like BERT for the <laughs> NLP community in a lot of ways, I guess GPT these days. But uh, anyway, so this is a very, very good recognition model. So what happens if we apply this recognition model to VCR. So we have this very challenging uh, task, which I've uh, asserted requires a lot of uh, reasoning style inferences. Uh, can we solve it with the recognition power of clip? Um, this is work uh, from a lot of uh, awesome folks, uh, including uh, Harold Lee, who was uh, our intern uh, last summer. So shout out to uh, Harold for this uh, and all of the co-authors. Uh, but uh, right, so what happens if you just apply clip to VCR? Uh, it's a multiple choice task. I've obscure, I, I, I've hidden the choices here, but it's four way multiple choice. So random is 25%. Um, you get all the way up to 55% just applying clip in a zero shot way, way above random, but uh, still lots, lots of room to go. Um, if you do a lot of fancy pre-training tricks using clip, uh, you can push that number all the way up to 68. So big improvement. Um, but Actually, even before Clip, there was a model out there that had no Clip uh, that was uh, doing much better than this. So uh, it was Villa at the time. Uh, so this is sort of like the drum roll moment. So we have Villa, it's doing really well. What happens if we substitute in Clip features with uh, Villa? Uh, so surely, you know, this recognition bottleneck is going to be uh, released and we'll get, you know, human level performance on VCR if we add in Clip. Um, turns out, no. Uh, it turns out that adding in clip and doing a lot of work um, to make this you know, number happen, uh, you only get around a 1% boost by adding in much, much better recognition features compared to the prior uh, work. And I think together, uh, these results are a little bit older, but I think the message still rings true, which is that recognition is probably not the bottleneck for many vision and language tasks like VCR. So um, this holds for other tasks, this holds for other models, um, but for this example, uh, I'm hopeful that you could see what I'm talking about when I say that uh, when we added in clip, this really good recognition model, it didn't solve the task. So probably not the, the bottleneck here. Um, good. So um, that completes the case. So that's the uh, core argument here. One, uh, well, so I guess point zero is multimodal models are really cool. And uh, if you're considering, you know, a research topic or an area, I would highly recommend them. They're very fun to work with. That's point zero. <laughs> but the first part of the core argument here is that, uh, you know, to build these cool language technologies, we need reasoning style inferences. And the second part is that we're not very good at this. So uh, this is the case for uh, reasoning beyond uh, recognition. Um, for the rest of today, I'm actually going to talk about uh, a few of our projects where we're trying to push beyond uh, recognition style inferences towards the more reasoning style ones. Um, and in the time that I have left, uh, I'll talk about uh, three different lines of work that uh, I'm really excited to share with you today. Um, and again, each of these are trying to push towards more uh, reasoning style inferences, which I think is what we need. So uh, the first line of work, uh, which I'll talk about, deals with uh, temporal reasoning. So here, uh, this is uh, Merlot. It was joint work with a lot of folks from UW and AI2, and it was presented at uh, NeurIPS in 2021. Um, the idea here is that Clip, uh, in addition to not being very good at VCR, like we talked about before, is actually not very good at temporal reasoning. So there's this awesome data set from Huang et al. Uh, called Visual Storytelling, where you have a bunch of sentences, each paired with an image, but they connect in a coherent, uh, wait. So in this case, we have a heartwarming uh, story of, you know, an older man riding uh, to the top of an escalator and then meeting his kids at the top. Um, and if you ask Clip to order the frames in the story, it actually ends up making a mistake. So it says um, in a zero shot way uh, that, you know, the man actually gets to the top of the escalator prior to um, him writing it, which doesn't quite make sense. And it's not just this one example, like I have numbers coming, uh, but it, Clip is not very good at this. And so, yeah, we're going to see if we can build a model that is very good at this. 
And uh, the key idea here is that we're going to try to learn about the temporal world uh, using a very large corpus of web videos. So uh, the game plan is that we're going to go download, say, 6 million web videos, train a giant transformer model on those web videos. And hopefully, when we transfer that model to downstream tasks, it will have a better sense of time compared to, for example, clip. So very standard kind of game plan for pre-training and fine-tuning. Uh, but nonetheless, we can proceed. Uh, so we did this, yeah. So we downloaded a bunch of videos, and we built a giant multimodal transformer. Um, I won't get too much into the modeling details here, but the cool part, I think, of Merlot was a pre-training objective that was temporal ordering. Um, Merlot takes in two video frames. Half the time, the video frames are uh, given to it in the correct temporal order, and the other half of the time, they're mismatched. And the pre-training objective challenges the model to decide whether two frames are correctly temporally ordered or not. And uh, we have some relations that suggest that this uh, pre-training objective, along with other uh, sort of more standard pre-training objectives, uh, does give the model uh, more capacity for temporal reasoning, um, especially in a zero-shot way. Uh, so cool. So we did this. Um, and it turns out Merlot actually does order this particular instance correctly. So this is great. Uh, and I promised you numbers. It's not just this one instance. But uh, in general, Merlot was outperforming for this sort of zero-shot ordering task uh, prior work of the time. And it wasn't just doing this in a zero-shot way. Uh, this is the fine-tuned results for the Merlot model on the VCR task. And uh, at the time, this was uh, soda per uh, base size model. So this was doing very well. Um, if I was to update this slide, the numbers would all be a little bit higher, and it might be a little harder to get soda on this task uh, these days. But uh, at the time, this was a very strong uh, model. Um, so we also applied it to 12 other uh, tasks that presumably require temporal reasoning. I won't get into the details of all of these things, but uh, at the time, Merlot really pushed the state of the art for all of these, uh, which was good to see. Um, cool. So uh, we had a follow-up to Merlot, uh, Merlot Reserve. Uh, in this project, uh, which was presented at CVPR last year, um, we added an additional modality. So uh, prior version of Merlot was just trained on images and audio, uh, ASR transcriptions of text, whereas the new version, Merlot Reserve, also incorporates the raw audio signal. So um, there's a lot of work that goes into pre-training a two-modal model, a bimodal model. <laughs> there's even more work that goes into pre-training a trimodal uh, model. So uh, as I'm sure folks in this call have experience with Models love to cheat. Uh, they love to take shortcuts. They love to hack your pre-training objectives. It's very, uh, so it's kind of like a battle to, you know, design an interesting enough objective that they uh, learn something cool without cheating. Um, so lots of work went into designing these objectives. Um, I won't get into the details, but it amounts to uh, masked prediction across various modalities. And we balance the task such that uh, it can't cheat uh, as readily by construction. So trimodal encoder. Uh, we have audio, we have text, we have images. Uh, we're doing masked prediction between and across all of these modalities. Uh, we also made some other engineering improvements. So we more than double the size of our pre-training data set from 6 million videos to 20 million videos. We trained a large size model, so 700 million parameters, which sounds kind of small these days. But um, it's especially hard to train these uh, larger models, I think, uh, in the multimodal space because you have so much extra compute required to process images. So uh, the jump from 400 million to 700 million uh, was uh, a lot of work. <laughs> but uh, and yeah, we trained this model from, uh, I think a lot of it was trained from scratch. I think maybe the text encoder was uh, Roberta, but everything else I think was from scratch. Um, and we trained it for two weeks on the equivalent of 512 GPUs. Um, so this was nice. Uh, here is where I uh, am going to shout out Google. <laughs> so we didn't actually train on GPUs. We trained on TPUs, which are the special chip that Google uh, makes in-house that's really, really good at doing matrix multiplications and other sort of matrix operations. And uh, shout out to Google. Thank you for donating the uh, TPU time for this work. Um, yeah, so how does it do, this new and improved version of Merlot? Well, uh, if you go through and look at sort of similar benchmarks as before, 
you'll find that uh, our, the new models do better. So <laughs> probably wouldn't have gotten into CDPR without that being true. But uh, more than just the new models being better, uh, we have some interesting lessons in here. So uh, one thing that we found was that pre-training with audio, with this new setup, uh, can help even when the downstream task doesn't have audio. So uh, we were looking at TVQA, which in one of the settings does not have audio associated with it. And the similarly sized Merlot model uh, underperforms significantly compared to the new model. Uh, this isn't a perfect comparison because there are a lot of other differences. So it's a different training run. It's a different pre-training data set. So this isn't a fully controlled study, but nonetheless, uh, we have some qualitative results and also a demo that suggests that audio representations are actually helpful for this sort of thing. Uh, so this is nice. Um, it's not always the case though. So I wish the story was as simple as audio helps with everything, but uh, it's not always the case. So <laughs> things can vary depending on the task. Um, so some interesting lessons in these results tables. And yeah, uh, we also have zero shot results on uh, a lot of different data sets. I think this is going to become increasingly common in uh, not only vision and language, but in multimodality more broadly, uh, much like you know GPT-3, GPT-4, uh, like operates largely in zero and few shot fashion. I know you can fine tune GPT-3, but uh, a lot of the work is in a few shot fashion. I think this is also going to happen with multimodal models. Like I think it's just inevitable that when they get better, we're going to look for harder settings and zero shot settings are uh, some of the hardest out there. And uh, at least at the time, uh, we were doing quite well on a lot of zero-shot benchmarks, so uh, this is nice. Um, and this these range from uh, question answering to sort of embodied um, like camera from a first-person perspective uh, to various other situations as well. Uh, so lots of really good zero-shot results. Um, and yeah, I think that's all I want to say about the Merlot and Reserve uh, line of work. Um, I will shout out uh, uh, Rowan, uh, who led the engineering work here. Rowan is amazing, uh, and he is uh, at OpenAI these days. Uh, and we learned this week uh, that you know he was one of the folks working on the GPT-4 uh, image uh, edition, which I'll talk about uh, later. So uh, kudos to Rowan for that. Uh, um, and yeah, uh, we learned a lot from this project, and I think that's all I want to say about it. So. Um, Cool. So I'm going to move on to uh, not pre-training, but new benchmarks. Uh, the final two things I'll talk about today are new benchmarks. Uh, the first one is called Sherlock, and it deals with a type of reasoning that you may or may not have heard of before called abductive reasoning. Um, so this uh, right, so this is joint work with a lot of folks from uh, UW and AI2 and uh, Berkeley and Boston University. Um, and yeah, I want to start out with this work by introducing what abductive reasoning even is. Um, I hadn't heard of it before uh, this project, so no worries if you haven't heard this word before. Um, so abductive reasoning is kind of a third type of reasoning to complement deductive and inductive reasoning. And it was first formalized by this person named Pierce. And Pierce, in a very 1903 old fashioned uh, sort of way, uh, said abduction is the process of forming explanatory hypotheses. It's the only logical operation which introduces any new idea. Uh, so this really, it's not really a definition, but you know, it's very grandiose. So maybe, maybe this is true. So what is he talking about? Um, so uh, what he's talking about is the probable best guesses we make in the face of incomplete information. So take this scene. Uh, I don't know why all of my examples are kitchens. I'm just noticing this now. <laughs> um, I do like to cook, so maybe I'm just drawn to this sort of thing. But anyway, um, in this image, we can see some you know, pots and pans, and things seem to be a little bit uh, messy. Uh, and we can start making guesses about how the scene may have come to be. So we can envision perhaps that you know someone was cooking breakfast for someone, maybe a group of people based on how many pans there are. That might not 100% be true. Maybe this is just someone who's very messy and only does dishes, you know, at the end of the week or something like that. No, no judgment, no judgment. But uh, these are the types of, you know, uh, inferences that we make in our everyday lives. Uh, they're not 100% verifiable, but um, we nonetheless use them to operate in our messy and incomplete world. Um, so uh, another Pierceism. <laughs> Deduction proves that something must be, you know, like A implies B and B implies C implies A implies. So it's like very definitive. Uh, induction shows, you know, things are operative so that you can, 
the abductive hypothesis, but abduction, uh, you know, posits hypotheses that you can't necessarily verify, but nonetheless perhaps provide new information that you can't get from these other two types of inferences. Um, good. So um, what, what did we do? We collected a data set of abductive inferences over images. Uh, what we did was we gave crowd workers images like this and asked them to annotate in a two-step process. In the first step, we asked them to identify salient objects uh, in the image. So pointing to clues that uh, are, you know, like interesting parts of the image. So in this case, the annotator pointed to this sign and then uh, said that this was a sign with words in a language other than English. Uh, that's step one. In step two, the annotators go beyond the image and make inferences that are not necessarily 100% verifiable, but are things that they think could be true or are plausible. So for this sign example, uh, the annotator said, it's possible that this sign indicates that this scene is taking place in Spain. Now, again, uh, this inference may not be true. Like there are signs in Spanish in places that are not Spain. So like everywhere in the world, like Mexico, for example, has a lot of signs in Spanish. So, uh, and yet if this actually was in Mexico, we wouldn't say that the annotator did anything wrong. Uh, abductive reasoning by definition is defeasible. You can be wrong and you didn't do anything wrong, if that makes sense. Um, so we collected a ton of these inferences. And uh, in fact, I guess it's 363,000 uh, clue inference pairs situated across 103,000 images. And we did some analysis to show that our data set really does go beyond existing visual common sense resources. Um, so what's actually in this data set? Um, I don't know, it folks, so th this was one of my first times uh, working with crowd workers at this scale. Um, I'm not the expert <laughs> crowd worker uh, manager. This is Jenna. She's like amazing. She's the co-first author on this work. Uh, but like the things that people write are like really astounding. Like uh, people really uh, span the gamut of all different types of annotations. Like I always going through this data set sort of manually, I, you know, it's, I find interesting stuff there a lot. So um yeah, so what, what's actually in this? So people make uh, clue inference pairs that start from a tire and maybe uh, infer facts about like employment or like what this person's role is. So a name tag might indicate that this is like an employee at a store, for example. Um, so this is sort of like a cross topic inference. Um, People make within topic inferences as well. So uh, baked potatoes on a ceramic plate arranged in this particular way may indicate that this is like a side dish rather than like a main course. So uh, again, not 100% verifiable, but nonetheless, the sort of thing that someone might think is true. Um, and yeah, we are excited about this uh, data set and we think um, it's an interesting resource that complements the ones that are out there. Um, cool, so what did we do with this? Well. Machine learning in 2022, so you have to taskify it. Uh, you don't have to. I don't. I don't want to tell people what to do. But uh, we made three different tasks uh, with this data set. Uh, I'll briefly go over them now, not in too much detail. I will mention that despite these tasks having different structures, uh, we set up the leaderboard such that you actually can address all of these tasks with the exact same model, so long as it implements a relatively simple interface. Um, and actually, as a result of that design decision, um, to make it fairly easy to submit to this leaderboard, uh, I think our leaderboard has like 70 or so submissions now, making it, I think it's among the most popular leaderboards at AI2. I think that's true. So uh, we're happy to see that. But um, yeah, so getting back into what these actual tasks over this data set are, um, one you could imagine is retrieval. Uh, so the input here is an image and a bounding box within that image, and the output uh, is uh, the predicted sort of abductive inference here. Uh, in this case, it's kind of a dry one. It's like this plane is from France. Um, I've actually, I've used this picture before and people have informed me that this plane is a special plane called the Concorde. I don't know if there's any aviation aficionados in here, but apparently this is like a supersonic jet. Um, so if you ever <laughs> are at an aviation museum, do, do look for this one. Uh, but anyway, uh, so this plane, this bounding box together, perhaps implied that this plane is from France, which is indeed actually correct. But um, right, so this is retrieval. Uh, for localization, it's kind of 
flips the task on its head. So you're given the image and the inference, and the goal is to highlight the region within the image that provides the best evidence for uh, that inference. And finally, we have human correlation studies where we ask a separate set of crowd workers who did not label the data, um, or at least we're using a different interface compared to the labeling interface to rate uh, different hard negatives about how likely they are. And so the models are rewarded with correlating their scores with the human plausibility judgment. Uh, so overall, uh, these three tasks together form uh, this leaderboard. Um, it's been out for, I guess, oh my gosh. So we made this leaderboard, um, I want to say probably not a year ago, a little less than a year. And our initial best score for the human comparison uh, task was 27 uh, accuracy points. I'll not talk about the details, but uh, we were getting 27 when we submitted the paper. Uh, the leaderboard winner right now is at around 31 after like 70 or so submissions, which is really cool. Like we were super happy to see the interest in this. Um, but human agreement is at 42. So uh, this is a subjective task. So agreement isn't like 100%, but yet we have really carved out this gap again between model performance and human performance. So if you're feeling like you want to study abductive visual inferences, give this leaderboard shot. Uh, we think it's a fun task. Um, cool. uh, right. So what does the model actually predict? Uh, so these are some sample predictions from the model. Uh, so you have like a sort of traffic accident scene where uh, the model is predicting things like the road is icy. Uh, the predictions really are localized. So if you hand it a different region within the same image, it really does talk about different things. Um, we have like a bar scene. Um, again, I actually didn't know about this, but apparently um, for the annotators we asked to annotate these images, poinsettias mean the holiday season. Uh, I looked this up and I guess this is a thing that I just never notice like this is even like in the US like apparently at like Christmas time people put out poinsettias I maybe I'm just not observant but apparently this is a thing so the model is uh teaching me about these red flowers that come out during Christmas so uh interesting um it doesn't do everything perfectly so um one fun example of an error case is this up in the upper right you see this boat and uh at the front of the boat is the sign that says buy now plants. So this is some sort of florist shop, but, uh, and humans think it's a florist shop, but it turns out models kind of don't make this inference yet, probably because this is a rather unusual location for a florist shop that it's never seen something like this before. So still some work to be done. Um, I'll skip over the uh, ablations. I'll just mention that um, in case, I, this is a very practical uh, tip, and maybe this is something that people know about, but I'll just mention it. Um, if you're ever working with a data set where you have images and regions within that image that act as an input, so in the retrieval setting here, we have images and like the region, uh, a very good baseline for incorporating that region information into your downstream model is to literally render the bounding box in like the actual pixels of the image. So we tried a bunch of different smarter modeling techniques to pass this reference to models. And time and time again, for a variety of models, we find that literally just drawing in a bounding box is like a really, really uh, hard to beat baseline. Uh, and it also makes uh, ablations much clearer. So to ablate different parts of the model, we actually can just draw on the image in different ways. So uh, just a practical tip in case you're uh, thinking about uh, image plus region uh, tasks. Um, Cool. Uh, right. So I think that's all I want to say about Sherlock. Again, data sets out there, leaderboards out there. We would love to uh, chat with folks if they're interested in this sort of thing. And we really want to bridge that uh, gap so that our machines can do abductive reasoning uh, on our data set as well as humans. Um, cool. So the final thing uh, I'll talk about today, I know I'm sort of running lowish on time, is uh, this direction that I'm super, super excited about, uh, which I'm calling uncommon sense reasoning. Uh, and to talk about this, I'm going to talk about uh, some ongoing work. Um, this is WHOOPS. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Nitsen and Jonathan and uh, a bunch of awesome collaborators. Um, this is a new data set. Uh, this is a data set that consists of 500 images. And these images are uh, created using uh, text-to-image tools like Midjourney and Dolly 2. So uh, in case you haven't 
used one of these things before, you essentially write out a caption and the model imagines using, using a diffusion process to like the actual image that might be associated with that caption. And as a result, you can really make you know, fairly creative and cool images. And in this case, we were very focused on unusual images. So um, here are some examples. Uh, one of my favorite ones here is the Northern Lights uh, in Paris. So um, Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights tend to happen at much, uh, I guess, more Northern um, longitude. Is that right? I think that's the up and down one. <laughs> the Northern Lights tend to not happen in Paris. Uh, and yet we were able to uh, have an artist create this image of the Northern Lights happening in Paris. And that is what makes this image unusual. Um, we have a corpus of you know, 500 images that are unusual for concrete and arguably uh, entertaining reasons. <laughs> I like this wind turbine that is too short and would not get any wind because of the trees, uh, for example. So uh, each one of these is sort of fun to play with. And um, different than a lot of visual common sense tasks that are out there, these sort of uncommon sense tasks flip things on their head. So for something like VCR, which is this example that we've been returning to, uh, the input is usually something like an expected scenario. And the question answer is about, you know, what is the likely thing to happen? Uh, so this is a very good way of testing for common sense, but it's not the only way. In contrast, these uncommon sense images, these unusual images depict an unexpected scenario. And the goal is to reason about why a particular situation is a violation of common sense. So it kind of tackles the problem from a complementary direction. Um, these are not <laughs> just limited to mid-journey generation. So um, these exist in the wild as well. I spend way too much time on uh, Twitter. And in my uh, scrolling on Twitter, <laughs> I found this account called Pictures of the End. So this is apparently pictures of the end of the world that like signs that like the end is coming. And so these are unusual images that people have taken in the wild. So a Coke can being sold in a plastic thing, <laughs> kind of unusual. Uh, Jack in the box, like this fast food restaurant, but Jack has popped out of the box. So uh, these sorts of things exist in the wild as well. And um, actually, speaking of GPT-4, um, I guess this slide is inaccurate because I did mention GPT-4 <laughs> uh, already, but um, we were really excited to see that the folks over at OpenAI are also interested in these sort of unusual images. So. Uh, some of their flagship examples for their image augmented language model um, are these uncommon sense images. And so in this case, we have sort of an older connector being plugged into a modern phone. Uh, GPT-4 gets this one correct, uh, but will it get the whoops ones correct? Um, that wasn't, <laughs> we actually don't know. We're trying to get them to run it. So it's, it's in the works, but I'll have some other results that aren't GPT-4 in a second. Um, so uh, what do we actually do with these images? Well, uh, the first thing we do is we pose a binary classification task for each uh, weird image. We have a more normal uh, analogous version of it, and we challenge the models to differentiate between unusual and normal ones. So again, these things can be kind of subtle. So if you take these two Rubik's cubes, uh, it turns out in the data set, the one on the right is the unusual one because the purple side is solved already with all nine squares, and yet there exists a 10th purple one, which makes this Rubik's cube unsolvable. Um, so in this case, the one on the right is labeled as unusual. Um, and uh, the second part of this task is the explanation task, where we actually uh, challenge the models in a generation setting to explain why a particular image is unusual. So here is a uh, rather verbose description of why uh, this image is unusual. Um, Cool. So these are just two of the tasks. There are several more, but uh, this is the one that I'm going to talk about. Um, great. So yeah, how well do models do? Um, humans are in the 90s for both of these tasks. Um, the uh, binary decision task is evaluated with accuracy, and the explanation task is evaluated with human ratings. Um, models are not so good at this. So on the binary task, uh, flip to flan T5XXL, uh, which is sort of this new vision language model, which I would say is among the best publicly available vision language models. When fine-tuned on this corpus gets around 73% at this uh, uh, identification task, and only around 27% of the time does it generate a human-rated acceptable explanation. Um, and so if you look at the model generations here, um, if you look at the 11 billion model, a Rubik's cube is made up of six identical squares. Kind of doesn't seem like it's really understanding what's going on. Um, 
And similarly for this, you know, uh, children around a like fire, but it's inside. Um, it says that children do not sit around a fire, they sit around a television, which again shows that it's not really quite understanding why this is unusual. Like this would be a very normal image if it were the case that this was happening like at a campsite, for example. Um, cool. So yeah, we're quite excited about uh, this new benchmark. Uh, the data set uh, is out there and we're excited to see uh, what people do with it. And uh, I don't know, it's, fun, it's a fun data set to play around with. So uh, give it a shot if you're interested in this sort of thing. Um, Right. Okay. So uh, I'm definitely out of time now, uh, but just to quickly recap, uh, today I talked about three different types of reasoning uh, that go beyond uh, recognition. And yeah, thank you so much for uh, the invite and for your attention. And I'm happy to chat about uh, ongoing work or any of uh, what I talked about today. So yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>